Okay, let's start today's video with a bit of a mystery from the 1972. The mystery of bizarre spaceballs. Unusual spherical objects discovered in a lot of locations in Australia and New Zealand, first reported in 1963, but then regularly discovered in a lot of locations, very often somewhat broken, but without clear indication where they came from. And so following the first discovery in 1963 in western New South Wales, which was of course during the peak of the Cold War, this basically resulted in a lot of different speculations. Anything from some kind of an advanced ancient civilization, possibly residing in Australia or New Zealand, to the more likely damaged UFO, or something created by aliens and sent to planet Earth. And a lot of these space balls were eventually sent to the Australian Defense Science Agency in order to actually figure out what this was. And well, it turns out that this was not aliens and not alien civilizations. Because these were made of titanium, vanadium and aluminium alloys, and because in many cases they actually contain certain marks, this turned out to be a part of a satellite. These were believed to be either pressurized fuel tanks or stabilization jets used by various early satellites launched by the United States and USSR. But it was really the report of these two space balls from 1972 that we're going to be discussing today. The re-entry of these two space balls was witnessed by farmers in New Zealand, and when examined, they turned out to have Cyrillic alphabet. And that's because these two balls came from a Soviet mission that unfortunately failed. The mission that would technically be known as Venera 9. A Venus-bound mission launched in 1972, but that basically became secretive because it did not succeed. Back then, the Soviet program only reported successful missions and basically buried all failures. But the actual reason we're talking about this is because this mission is now going to be entering Earth after spending over 50 years in outer space. Or basically this probe that was launched in 1972 is now certainly going to be re-entering the planet sometimes around May 10th of 2025. And so in this video, let's basically discuss everything we know so far and also what we know about its eventual re-entry and of course where it might land. But I guess first let's start with a bit of a history and with the history of these Venera missions that were surprisingly successful. Successful compared to anything modern Russia can produce and arguably even more successful than the Martian missions by the United States. And that's because between 1961 and 1984, the Soviet Union was able to launch 13 successful missions that were able to enter the Venusian atmosphere and several of these missions even landed, returning some of the humanity's first images from another planet. Here's actually that iconic shot from 1975, representing not just the first image from Venus, but the first image from the surface of any planet. And so this was a ridiculously successful program. And though the first few missions were satellites, in 1970, Venera 7 became the first spacecraft to successfully soft land on another planet. But one of the main reasons for their success was actually the way these missions were launched. They were always launched in pairs. Or essentially here, there would always be two rockets and two landers, launched a few days apart in case one of them failed. And while following that landing of Venera 7, two years later there was Venera 8. But as before, this was a pair. Technically, this would have been Venera 8 and Venera 9. These two probes looked something like this. The first one was launched on March 27, 1972. The second one was launched approximately four days later. And Venera 8 was successful, but its partner was not. Its partner unfortunately failed for a somewhat silly reason. Here, one of the boosters that was supposed to take it to Venus unfortunately had a timer set incorrectly, and so the engine shut down before all of the fuel was used up, leaving the probe in an extremely eccentric orbit. And so he was never able to leave Earth's orbit and stayed here for the last 50-something years. And the orbit here was really extreme. At its farthest approach, the lander was about 9,000 kilometers away from planet Earth, but at its closest, it was only about 210 kilometers. But instead of calling this a failure, just like every other orbiting satellite, eventually this satellite received an official Soviet name. It became known as Cosmos 482. In this case, all of the Earth planetary missions were always referred to by Cosmos name as long as they orbited planet Earth. And well, as of the time I'm making this video, it is still in orbit. As a matter of fact, this website, Stuff in Space, the link for which you can find in the description, basically shows you exactly where the satellite is right now and also exactly what its current orbit sort of looks like. As you can see, it's no longer elliptical and is definitely low enough that it's eventually going to re-enter the planet. 
but intriguingly enough, because of the profile and the design of this probe, it's extremely likely to survive the re-entry. Here we basically have a thousand pound or approximately 500 kilogram lander designed to withstand hundreds of atmospheres of pressure and 300 Gs, because it was designed specifically to enter extremely hot, extremely thick Venusian atmosphere. And though previous Venusian probes only survived for a few minutes to maybe a few hours, they were still durable enough to withstand extreme atmospheric conditions, and were of course designed for a soft landing on Venus, which is exactly what happened to its partner Venera 8. It was able to survive for almost an hour, transmitting a lot of data from the surface. And actually following the failure of this mission, Venera 9 and Venera 10, as well as Venera 11 and Venera 12, were all even more successful and were even heavier. Venera 9 is of course the one that took the first pictures, and Venera 12 was one of the first missions to present us with some of the first details of what exactly Venusian atmosphere was made out of. And so because of the design of these probes, it's extremely likely that this probe will also survive most of the passage through Earth's atmosphere. Now it's not going to be entirely intact, but most of the probe will probably survive. And so because this is such an exciting event, and also because of its historical significance, in the last few years this object has been tracked by a lot of different astronomers. Here you can actually see the observations from 2020 by Marco Langbroek. But intriguingly some of the recent observations, including some of the most recent pictures by Ralph Vandenberg, suggest that there is something trailing the probe. It's not entirely clear what it is, but it has been suggested to be either the parachute that was supposed to open on Venus to slow down the probe, or some other structure such as maybe the booster that never separated. But if this is a parachute, there's a high chance it's going to completely burn out during the re-entry and is unlikely to slow down the probe at all. Either way, whatever this is, it seems to be attached to the probe. But the obvious next question, and I guess the most important question is, so where exactly is it going to crash? Well, obviously right now this is kind of unknown. But you can get some of the most up-to-date tracking from this vlog in the description by Marco Langbroek. And so for example here we have our most likely prediction of re-entry, which right now seems to be May 10th, and the potential trajectory during this time, and so it could be anywhere along one of these lines. Although as you can see from this image, there's also a chance it's once again going to enter Australia or New Zealand. Obviously the chance here is super small. And if it does crash on land, well that is going to be super exciting. For one, it's actually going to contain one of these inside. These USSR medallions were extremely common in a lot of different Soviet missions, and would probably cost a fortune today. Not to mention a lot of historical and even sentimental value. But technically, whoever discovers this would probably have to return this to the owner. This is actually according to the space law. Any space junk is required to be returned to the national owner, in this case, the Soviet Union. And to be more exact, it would actually belong to the Russian Academy of Sciences that took over after the Soviet Union fell apart. But there is still an extremely high chance is just going to end up somewhere in the ocean. And I don't think dolphins are going to be returning this anytime soon. And so once this probe does re-enter, and once we actually find out what's going on, I'll come back and discuss this more in some of the future videos. Until then, maybe check out some of the older videos on the channel that actually do discuss the Venera missions by using the Kerbal Space Program. You can find the links for these super old videos somewhere in the description. Anyway, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space, come back tomorrow to learn something else, Support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow and as always, bye bye.